Cost segregation and bonus depreciation. Um, this is something that all of you as real estate owners should be cognizant of. I'll give you a brief introduction about myself. Um, I, my previous experience has been in upper management roles in manufacturing and a real retail uh, chain. What I'm utilizing my analytical skills for are cost segregation studies. I've been with CSSI for over 10 years. I work out of the Chicago area, but I coordinate studies in all 50 states and all property types. And there's my contact information. Several things we're going to cover today. First of all is, you know, what is cost segregation and how does it lend itself to maximize uh, cash flow? Talk about bonus depreciation, uh, QIP, and 179 expensing. One thing you'll notice here on the one bullet point is that it talks about 27 and a half years versus 39 years. The IRS guidelines are that for most property types, there's a 39 year straight line depreciation. However, for multifamily, which I think most of you are involved with, that's a 27 and a half years. So what we try to do here at, at CSSI for the last, uh, since 2003, 18 years, is to not just provide cost segregation studies, but also be a depreciation specialist. What we do at, at no cost is provide consulting services with our for our clients to be able to help them make uh, the best decisions that they can, and we do that at, at no charge. You might be doing reno renovations, and we can assist you with that. What's there's different strategies to utilize to uh, so that you can either expense or uh, capitalize some of your repairs and expenses. We'll get into you can see the pyramid to the right. There's the tangible property regulations, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the CARES Act, and cost segregation. You see the red lines through the CARES Act. Um, the majority of that is is uh, is no longer eligible because it expired with tax year 2020. One thing they had was a net operating loss a carry back. I was able to help one uh, hotel client receive hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes that he paid over the last five years. And but again, that 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 expired, so that's no longer applicable. There was a technical glitch that was corrected with uh, QIP qualified improvement properties. I won't get into all the details on that right now, but but it's basically to show you that uh, the strategies that we employ are not just the cost segregation, but the other things from it was the CARES Act, also the Ta Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and tangible property regulations. So just to be be cognizant of the fact that it's it's pretty extensive and it's, there's a lot of lot of detail associated with it. So what we want to do is be able to not make you a depreciation expert, but be able to uh, make you aware of the fact that there's a lot of uh, savings that you can have. So you can be a tax hero with your, with not only with your own properties, but also with uh, any of your clients that you work with or your investors or things of that nature. If you look at the bottom of this screen, it shows there's an opportunity to return between uh, $30,000 to $80,000 per, per million dollars. That would be per million dollars of building cost. One thing you need to do uh, with that is, is exclude the land value because the land cannot be depreciated. And one of the reasons for such a large spread between the thirty dollars to $80,000 uh, is that the big difference in, let's say, different property types. For all multifamily, they're, they're pretty comparable. But if you're looking at, let's say, like an industrial uh, warehouse distribution manufacturing, for for the million dollars, you're going to have a lot less uh, componentry infrastructure that will be able to be uh, depreciated for for that versus, let's say, like a medical facility, multifamily, and office things of that nature. Here's an interesting commentary from, from one of the senators. Uh, a tax loophole is something that benefits the other guy. If it benefits you, it's tax reform. And uh, one, one good thing to think about is, let's say that you own your own home. And you're able to, on your taxes, re uh, deduct what your property taxes are. You're able to deduct what your interest expenses are and things of that nature. Those are not tax loopholes. That's part of the IRS tax code. And, and the same thing with the cost segregation. It's not a tax loophole at all. And, you know, you, you hear a lot of people, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, 
Jeff Bezos and Donald Trump and others, you know, didn't, didn't pay taxes. And for the most part, I don't know all the nitty gritty of every individual, but for a lot of them, what they're doing is they're just utilizing the tax code to, uh, to their benefit. Now let's let's use uh, describe cost segregation utilizing the uh, the big Mac analogy. If you're looking at doing the straight line method, a, a hamburger is thirty three dollars and ninety nine cents. It's just one big one big unit. Sorry, my uh, screens. If you're looking at the cost segregation method, it's going to be separated in the components. For those of you who are old enough, you might remember the uh, the McDonald's commercial, two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Anybody here remember that? Yes, I do. <laughs> that, that, it's, it's funny when, when we do that, present that with uh, to, to young youngsters, uh, they don't they don't remember those those commercials, but but that's a good way to, to look at it, a good analogy for cost segregation because we're not looking at at the building as one big entity or the hamburger as one big entity. We're looking at it in its component parts, and that's basically what cost segregation does. So, what what does cost segregation do? It's, it separates out the the real property. And it's as a result of that, what you're able to do is when you think of, of looking at a profit and loss statement, you'll see a line item on there called depreciation. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. And when you can increase your depreciation, if you show you have, you have an, an income, and if your depreciation can be increased to as much as your income or greater than that, you can, uh, you can reduce you can eliminate your tax liability and potentially carry forward uh, it into future years. So that's how that works. Again, you can see the reference to the 27 and a half years to the 39 years. That's, that's because of the uh, multifamily and the other property types. One of the questions we get frequently is, you know, what size buildings qualify for this? A good rule of thumb we use is about $350,000 excluding the land value. I've, I've done some which are less than that. You're not going to get as much of a return on investment for those. Um, also, the, for tenants improvements, as small as uh, about two hundred fifty, about two hundred thousand dollars in cost. Our, our typical studies will generate returns in in the twenty to thirty times investment. Um, so I've seen more, and I've seen less. The ones which are less are typically the buildings with the lower lower cost structure in it. Now, one thing you'll see here is in red where it says eligible for uh, for bonus depreciation. What that is is a component tree within a building which has a less than a 20-year life. So you look at your tangible uh, personal property, um, QIP, lane improvements, things of that nature. Those can be uh, depreciated actually in the first year that you own a property. And these are some examples of, of some of the items which would be a tangible per, uh, personal property. I'm not going to read them all, but you can see the decorative, molding, carpet, uh, flooring, things like that, which have a five to seven year uh, life. You have the land improvements with the parking lot and concrete, landscaping, et cetera. And of course, there's always going to be some components in the property where you're still going to have the 39 or the 27 and a half year straight line depreciation. That'll be the you know structural elements of the property, foundation, walls, uh, et cetera. This again will give you a description of some of the components which would have a five or seven year uh, property and eligible for bonus depreciation to be depreciated in the, uh, the first year. I'll make a distinction here. I actually was working with a client here recently, and they said, you know, if, if I'm buying a property in November with bonus depreciation, is that really, is that going to be, you know, prorated based on how many months of the year that I owned it? And the answer is no. Um, you get the same 100% uh, right off for bonus depreciation for a tax year, for instance, 2021, if you acquired the property in January of 2021 or in December. So that, that 
it's not prorated based on the number of months that you've owned it in a calendar year. However, if you were to uh, close on a property, own it on December 31st, 2021, or if it's going to be January 1st of 2022, two, two big differences there with, with the one day. For 2021, of course, you can depreciate it, but you could not do it for tax year 2021. If it's in January 1st, it's going to have to go into the, uh, the next year. This uh, graphically depicts what the difference is between a straight line depreciation, accelerated depreciation, and bonus. You can see with the blue line, that's what your straight line uh, depreciation is going to look like. And the bonus, you can see with that huge spike there in the, in the first year, and that's what you can, uh, can depreciate the first year of ownership. Another question we get are, you know, what are the different building types that you can use for cost segregation? I know that most people on this call are mostly involved with the multifamily residential uh, properties, and it works great for that. Um, but it also works great for virtually every, every property uh, type. I've done a number of these different types here and uh, with, with, with great results. When you think about the fact you can't depreciate land, why would you think you'd be able to, it works well for a golf course, which is mostly land? Well, there's certain elements of a golf course. Let's say you have the clubhouse, you have the parking area, you have the landscaping, things like that, where you can still make the numbers work for even something like that, which is uh, predominantly land, even though the land cannot be depreciated. So the bonus depreciation is for properties purchased or built after September 27th, 2017. Now, prior to that time, bonus depreciation was just applicable for new construction. In fact, this is interesting. A couple of years ago, I was meeting with a property owner and his CPA. CPA had been in business over 30 years. And I was showing the, the, uh, the preliminary analysis we had for his property and showing him bonus depreciation. And CPA is asking me, why are you talking about bonus depreciation? Because that's not applicable for, for, uh, for buildings which are, are purchased. And I said, well, you're correct. That's what it was several years ago, but that's not the case today. So one thing to be cognizant of the fact is, is that um, CPAs can and frequently are incorrect in, in providing guidance uh, for you. And that's one of the challenges that I sometimes have in, is educating uh, the CPAs, especially single practitioners who may not be, uh, be on top of all the tax rules and regulations. You can imagine in the 18 years we've been doing this, there's been a lot of changes. And that's one of the things that we do is stay, stay on top of all those things. Interest of time, I'm gonna skip over a, a couple of things. <clears throat> this will give you an example of some of the property types and, and sample studies that we've done. One, you can see uh, self-storage up there in the upper left, at tax savings over 45,000. Apartment building, 63,000, construction cost of 1.2 million. Uh, dental facility. Um, and, and by the way, this can, can work for uh, for tenant improvements. It, if the tenant's paying for it versus the landlord, um, there's a way in which the uh, the tenant can actually get the tax benefit as opposed to the landlord, depending on who's who's paying for that. And then in the right, there's an example there for uh, for multi my multi office complex for uh, savings over two million. And by the way, um, we've done this for for some projects. I mean, I had a, I had a portfolio of uh, of one tenant uh, here recently who who purchased uh, a number of single tenant net lease properties and uh, he informed me recently that we did such a great job on that he wants he's buying another four of them and wants to uh wants to have studies on those as well again here are some examples of some of the uh the property types funeral homes medical facilities leaseholds office you know etc and you can see the the tax benefits that can be derived from uh from our studies and then also the difference by having you can see the right hand column with the bonus depreciation how much more that is for for those 
Now, that's one ugly building. You, you take a look at that <laughs> and you think, my God, how could, what, what can you do with that? Well, it's not necessarily based on, on, on how it looks. It, it's what are the componentry of the building. Now, for this one, you think, as a building cost of about $1.8 million, however, we're able to do bonus depreciation of, of $877,000. Look at the percentage that is. That's huge. Well, why is that? Well, what you can't see is the large uh, parking area associated with this for trucks and other things, and that's considered 15-year property, so it could, so that can be uh, included in the bonus depreciation and and accelerated, you know, that first year. And, and take a look at in this particular example, the the fee that we had associated was uh, 5.8 excuse me, uh, $5,800, and look at that from a return on investment standpoint, uh, that's huge. And, and one point I'll make here in regards to the fee is that the fee is not percentage-based. It has nothing to do with what the savings is going to be. It's really based on all the work that's going to be entailed in, in doing the, uh, the, for our analysts to do the studies. This one's kind of detailed, uh, looks at, shows you some of the uh, information from the studies itself. This particular case talks about building components and all the different elements there. And we have very, very detailed um, information. And that's why it takes, you know, four to six weeks to, to complete these studies because there's so many hours associated with, with doing the analysis. Uh, they look at the photographs for everything. They look at the blueprints. They look at the appraisal. Um, they'll, they'll zoom in on all elements. You know, what's the model number of this security camera, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's very, very extensive. And, and one thing, I'll just back up on this for a second. Um, there, what we always do is what's considered uh, the gold standard of cost segregation, and that's engineering-based uh, cost segregation. And it requires a site visit for every single uh, property. You know, we, we've heard some people say, well, I can get this study done, you know, less. And I say, well, are they going to do a site visit? Well, no, they're not going to do that. Are they going to? have someone there taking photographs of everything and and doing doing all that because when you're dealing with the IRS you really want to have all that back uh, backup information um, we've never had a study overturned uh, we will at no cost defend uh, the owner in case they ever do get audited by the IRS and, and that could cost many thousands of dollars uh, to us but not to the client because we provide that free of charge and we've never had a study overturned uh, so we kind of have a perfect record in that regard and that is if you, if you do it all ball by the book you're not going to have any any issues again we kind of have to exclude the uh, the cares act because some of that information is not no longer uh, valid again in the interest of time you're qualified Pat, do you, are there any questions so far in the chat that, that you want me to address? Do you want me to keep moving forward? No, nope, not right now. Uh, we can open it up to questions in a few minutes if you want to. And if you're talking to me, unfortunately, I can't hear you. Um, uh, I said that uh, there's no, no questions in the chat right now. Can you hear me now, Mark? I can, yes. Awesome. Um but we can uh, break here in a few minutes and answer some questions. Nothing. I, people are saying it's a great presentation. Are the slides going to be available? Are you recording this? So it's it's uh, all all good comments right now. Sure, I can make the slides available. And is it being recorded? That's on your end. Yep, it is. It is, re cool. and that's good. Yes, it, I am recording it right now, folks. And uh, give me a day or two, and I'll have it uh, posted. So you can uh, view it later as well. So I know there's a lot okay. of information here. Yeah, excluding all the technical glitches, okay, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you there. <laughs> so one of the other questions uh, I kind of addressed this previously, what are good good prospects for cost segregation? Again, it's really going to be based on, you know, the, the building cost. And for $250,000, that usually pertains to a single family residences because we also do that for, for, for not for, for personal uh, living circumstances, but if you're using it for, for rental, uh, we, we do that as well. I had a client in San Diego recently who was uh, buying some single family homes, but then turning them into Air, Airbnbs and uh, that, that qualifies for, for that as well. All right, I do have a question came in. Uh, Annie asked a question, 
what about cost seg for new development? Is it different than existing, especially for eco-sustainable development of real estate? What does this look like? Please ask Mark. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, work, it works great for new construction uh, ones. In fact, sometimes I get, I get pulled in even pre-construction to do to, to uh, prepare a, uh, a no cost preliminary analysis so they can look at the numbers and put that in their pro forma to, to indicate whether or not it, it makes sense for them to do. As far as the eco-friendly part, uh, one of the things that we have in, in our company is, is a division that works on LED light retrofits. And that's one uh, thing that we're able to do. There's one thing called the uh, 179D. Uh, tax credits and we work extensively with that as well um, it, it's, as far as the other eco-friendly uh, I can't say anything particular to that it's just that whatever the cost is associated uh, especially um, well actually for acquisition or new construction it can be can be utilized the bonus depreciation uh, part of it um, one thing that while we're on this screen here it all starts with a uh, predictive analysis. What we do, and I do it on, on a pretty regular basis, almost daily, is provide a no-cost preliminary analysis for, for clients. And what we do is we have a, a PDF that asks information about the building, uh, when was it acquired, the in-service date, uh, the cost of it, excluding the land value, address, uh, tax rate, things of that nature. And then within several business days, we come back with a no-cost preliminary analysis. Based on the tens of thousands of studies that we completed, what we do is say, client, this is how much we estimate your savings to be. Now, that estimate is very conservative in nature. And over 90-some percent of the time, when the actual study is completed, the savings is greater than that. But we want to under-promise and over-deliver on what that estimate is so they can kind of hang their hat on it and, and recognize the fact that this is at a minimum what they're probably going to save, but it could be potentially uh, more and probably is. So again, we do that at no cost. I can do that for any property uh, nationwide and uh, working on projects all over the country uh, right now. Okay, I got another question here, Mark. Um, he asked, can we deduct replacing heated unit $3,100 in a single family rental property? The situation with that in order to get us involved is that for that small amount, the cost of study is probably going to be cost prohibitive in order to make the numbers work. Typically for, for, uh, improvements, things of that nature, you need to have something of at least a couple hundred thousand dollars in order to make the, make the numbers work. So I can so that would probably be not, quite frankly, not be a good fit for us. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the other thing is in regards to 1031 exchanges. Now, I, I've done a number of 1031 exchanges or typically uh, they're not syndications, just a single owner where they'll buy uh, frequently. It's like a doctor or someone who has a lot of uh, a lot of income and is buying uh, strip malls or single tenant net lease properties or things of that nature. It, it, it is a little bit more complicated because in order to provide the preliminary analysis, we need do need to look at what the depreciation schedule is of the, of the property that's being sold so we can look at the cost basis of that and then be able to, to see if it makes sense. But it does work and I've done a number of studies with the 1031 exchanges and it works well. Okay, awesome. Anybody have any more any questions, please type them in the chat and we'll get Mark asking answering them. This one here, all it's regarding the net operating loss carry forward. That's the one thing from the CARES Act, which is no longer applicable. Um, one thing to be cognizant of is there's something called uh, pads or partial asset disposition. This has to do with uh, assets that, that you're writing off that you're no longer using. 
and uh, for substantial renovation uh, projects or you know, capex projects, it, it's something that we can uh, we can assist with. I'd say a number of the projects that I'm working on right now is is the analysis of not just the acquisition but also the uh, the, the capex renovation expenditures that they're doing, and we can do a, a deep dive on analysis of that to ensure that that they receive the maximum uh, tax savings uh, possible. So I have a question on that, if you don't mind. When you're saying on that slide that you just showed, the so we want to come to you and say, listen, I'm going to do $100,000 of CapEx or repairs on a property. You'll want to take a look at what we're doing and give us a better idea of what the savings would be other than just replacing it, right? Correct. But like, for instance, uh and some of them I'm doing right now are some multifamily. I've asked for, for different information in addition to the basic that I just described earlier is, and, and for a preliminary analysis, we're just looking for an, an estimate. And that is maybe you have a spreadsheet that says, I'm spending $100,000 on a new roof, or I'm spending you know $50,000 on your carpeting, or whatever that is. And then what we do is we take a look at those numbers and we include that in our estimate. And then when, when we actually do the study, we, uh, the analysts do a deep dive on the, on the CapEx to be able to ensure that they could get the maximum us, us benefits on that as well. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's see, you got a couple questions here. Uh, how many years forward can the cost seg depreciation be claimed or applied? Is there a cap or hard stop when you can't anymore apply it, I guess? Yeah, in, in the past, I know that, that you've been able to, to, to extend it for whatever period of time it takes for you to, uh, to utilize that. You know, for most of our clients, you know, they, they have enough, uh, enough income so that they're able to use that up fairly readily. I know there's been some conversation about, you know, maybe diminishing that amount in, in, in future years. Um, but if I'd say for the lion's share of clients, that's not going to be an issue. You're going to be able to, to utilize uh, all the, all the de depreciation, even if you can't use it in the first year. Okay, cool. And uh, Annie asks, uh, can you show the slide on list of what can be included or excluded in a cost seg depreciation again? That wasn't an all-inclusive list, right? That was... And again, we'll, we'll get these slides to you too as well, folks. And again, sure. we appreciate you being so patient. Um, can, you, can you check if, if, if Annie, is this the one she was referring to or a different one? You just pass, go forward one slide, Pat. If you can go forward. forward I one I saw slide. It. This kind of this kind of summarizes it, and if you go to the is that sorry, get this slide? My mouse is getting a little mousy here. Right. So if we can get the slide, I can go through that. It's a matter of it's more of a helpful aid for some of us folks, I guess. <laughs> okay. No, that's a good question. That's a good question, Annie. Um, he's trying to get to it here. It's hard, to, it's hard to remember them. I can't rely on my memory. I like to get a checklist and say, okay, it may not be all inclusive, but that's okay. At least it's a place to start. Yeah, if you look at this one, it shows the, uh, the different yeah. breakouts. Yeah, yeah that's is, right. That, right. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, if you look at the one before, that really just kind of kind of looks at a summary of what's eligible for bonus depreciation. And then when right. you look at the following slide, that's where it gives you a breakout of those of those different categories. So the ones to the, the three buckets on the right, those are the ones that are eligible for the bonus depreciation. If you look okay. at the one on the far left where it says base building real property, 
there are certain okay. elements of that which uh, which cannot be uh, depreciated, you know, immediately with bonus depreciation, and that's what that represents. Right. So if we can, have, since they're in multiple slides, if we can have the slides or PDF, that'd be great, Pat. It'd be great. Yep, you'll get the slides of PDF, and I know it's a lot of information. But a that's lot of great, information. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for asking the question. Any other questions? Go ahead, Mark. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I said, go ahead, and then I'm going to start talking. The, the, that, that last screen you just showed uh, with the different thing, the funeral home, I'm just really taken back by the amount of um, money that you can save by doing this. I knew they were good. I've heard that for a long time in this business, but man, just some of the savings I mean, in that horrible building you, you saw that they paid a million seven for, and yeah. they're getting that much back in, in, let's say, tax relief. That's, that's just huge. I mean, that is. It, it is. I mean, and what's interesting about it is the fact that you can have the same building and it, uh, it qualifies again for cost segregation every time there's a new owner. So you can do it now and you can sell it five years from now and the new owner can do the exact same thing. And I've heard of some people that say they just trade properties back every five years. That's usually the, the whole time, you know, we recommend in order to get the maximum you know, benefit. So it's, you know, if you're not emotionally attached to something, you know, and there's other, other circumstances as well, but you know, because the tax benefits are, are so huge, that's, that's what a lot of people are doing. I mean, that, that's one heck of a good strategy when you hear people say, you know, they pay little or no taxes. Mm -hmm. They're not doing anything illegal, folks. They're just know the rules, right? Know the game, and they work within the rules. Yeah, that's exactly what? right. And um, one thing I'll address here in regards to the, to the estimate, I told you about what information we look at in order to provide that estimate. When a client decides to move forward with a project, um, we, with the preliminary analysis, we not only show them what their estimated tax savings are going to be, and again, that's very conservative, and we also what the fee is. When they move forward, 50% of the fee is due up front, and within a week or so, we actually, usually within days, we have uh, someone, we have boots on the ground throughout the country who will do a, a site visit and will take photographs of the property and just get, get the process going. And it typically takes about four to six weeks in order to complete a project. Um, as you can imagine, we're incredibly busy just before tax season, and sometimes it does get pushed out in, into eight weeks. So keep that in mind when you're, uh, especially this time of year, as the end of the year is approaching, you, you want to make sure that you get a cost segregation study, not at the 11th hour for your CPA or tax professional to take a look at it because, you know, they want to have some time to be able to, to look at the numbers and if there's any question, you know, go back and forth and be able to, you know, put that in your tax return. So, so that's what, that's what the timeline is. And then upon completion, the, uh, the other 50% of the study uh, cost is, is due. I've got a question. So uh, that, 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 in the interest of time, I think that that probably covers it for now, Pat. But like I said, I'd be happy to uh, provide uh, the PowerPoint. And, and again, uh, we're able to provide a no-cost uh, preliminary analysis for any property nationwide. I'd be happy to, to work with anybody. Okay. We do have a question. Go ahead and ask a question. Mark, in one of the buckets, it showed um, with the bonus depreciation, it showed specialty plumbing. What qualifies specialty plumbing? That's a great question, and I'm not sure that I'm able to give you all the particulars on that right now. I'd be happy. One of the, I'll tell you one of the nice things about this is even though I've been with the company for 10 years, uh, there's sometimes things. I have, one thing I don't like to do is shoot from the hip. If I don't know something 100%, I'm not, I'm not going to you know, respond to that. Um, but w one thing I, I love is the fact that if somebody does have a question that I'm not 100% sure on, we've got a deep bench of people in the corporate office where I can get an answer for them uh, in a very quick 
a period of time to be able to address that. So I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't know the exact answer to that. Okay. What you can, what you can do is put your question in the chat and then I'm going to, I'm going to download the chat and I'll show everybody how to do that as well. And then we'll get that to Mark so he can get that answer back to you. How about that? That yeah. sounds wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. I, I don't get stumped very often, but sometimes, you know, there's a lot of detail there. <laughs> no, I don't know at all. We got a, we got a, we got a real good group here. We, I pulled in the best. <laughs> you do. You do. No, it's been, been great. And, and again, I appreciate all the people that have hung in there. Uh, I know it was, it was challenging there at the beginning, but uh, we'll, we'll have to figure out what the technical glitches are. So and if we do this again, it won't have the same problems. Definitely. Anybody else got any other questions? Okay. Well, listen, uh, if we don't, uh, we've run over a little bit more than uh, I anticipated. But again, thank you very much for this. Um, I appreciate your attention and staying with us. Thank you. And uh, like I said, I, it's this being recorded. Uh, I will get the recording out to you probably by Friday with the slides. Uh, there's Mark's contact information there as well and i'll get you that in the email that i send you with the link to this recording as well um and again thank you mark for taking your time and working through the the technical glitches and like you said we'll get it worked out and i appreciate everybody being patient uh and working with us during this um but definitely give mark a call uh, it's it's just the more I see this and the more I'm educated, it just makes, it just makes more sense to me to do this uh, in your properties because it just saves you so much money and saves you just so much energy and you can, you know, use it over and over again. So, but listen, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Mark, thank you for your time and effort in working through this. Um, Again, uh, go ahead and uh, just uh, put your questions in the chat. I'll leave it open for a few minutes here. And then uh, look for us next month, uh, second Wednesday of the month again. Uh, we'll have another awesome speaker on, uh, and we'll go from there. Any last questions, and I'll let you go.